so we are praying that the purpose this of meeting God, is being recorded. We are praying that the purpose of God will be preserved in our life. We in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor, we magnify your holy name, we thank you, we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all the saints say, Amen. 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 And we thank you all for coming um, at this time. Um, before we start the program, we want to share one music. Uh, Dr. Mark, if you will share one music as we reach out to others uh, to join us. Uh, this program, we, I believe that is going to benefit all of us. So we want to pray that everybody uh, will join. So as we are uh, going to listen to one music, we want to reach out to as many people as we can uh, before the speaker comes and before we introduce the speaker. We want to share one music as we send a message to somebody, call somebody that we have started and they should join. Amen. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving sees my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven. Babe, this gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid
around you say Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen. Thank you um, once again. Um, we are about to listen to um, the speaker. Um, he says somebody I know very well, actually. We went to the same high school um, in Ghana, but he was my senior. Um, one of the most brilliant students um, the school has ever produced. Um, I remember back in the days, they say you couldn't score A in biology. And in A level, he had A in biology. Um, we want to make an introduction of him. We also used to work out in the same gym. We uh, lived in the same neighborhood. Um, so he's like a senior brother and everything to me. Uh, we want to introduce him at this time. We will ask uh, um, Pastor to uh, give the introduction through a video or Dr. Mark, uh, anybody who is ready, amen. Dr. Daniel Amwa is a compassionate, board-certified family medical doctor based in Bradenton, Florida. He's also a certified coach, trainer, and speaker for John C. Maxwell and a founding partner of the John Maxwell team. Dr. Amwa received his medical training from KNUSD in Ghana and had his residency training at Montgomery Family Medicine Residency Program in Norristown an affiliate of Temple University. Dr. Amma has been practicing family medicine in Brandon for the past 10 years and is affiliated with both Blake Medical Center and Manatee Memorial Hospital. Dr. Amma's purpose is to inspire and equip others for a healthy and fulfilled life. One of his favorite quotes is from C.G. Jung. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Dr. Amor currently lives in Brandington with his wife and three children. In his spare time, he likes reading and providing free medical care at We Care Manatee, a not-for-profit organization in Manatee County. With a round of applause, let us please welcome Dr. Daniel Amwa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. I'm so excited to be with you. You know, PIWC, PIWC is a special place. I and my wife, we used to attend PIWC in Kumasi for many, many years. In fact, that was where I met my wife. So you can tell a PIWC is, <laughs> has a special place in my heart. We actually had our wedding PIWC in Kumasi. So wherever we go, we are also part of PRWC uh, Pennsylvania and later on Tampa, although now we attend a different church, but wherever we go, we make sure that we visit PRWC. And thank you, Eric and everybody, all the leaders, the difference PRWC and Church of Pentecost continue to make all over the world. Yeah, there's no place like home. So anytime that, you know, I go to, or I join PRWC, you know, members or Church of Pentecost, to me, it's like home. So I just want to say thank you, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure and honor to be invited, you know, to be part of this self-development. Uh, Jim Rome, mm -hmm. Jim Rome is dead now. Uh, he used to be a mentor uh, for Tony Robbins. He once said that uh, former education will give you a living and self-education will give you a fortune. You, we all know that there are six higher faculties of the mind. But the former education we have from kindergarten to PhD level mostly focus on two. We are talking about memory and reasoning. All right. So reasoning is logic. You know that, you know, and whether you're doing law, medicine, whatever you are doing is reasoning, logic. All right. One plus one is two. So that is wonderful. We learn. We also learn about memory although they expect you to remember what you've learned, all right, but they don't teach you how to remember it, all right? So uh, 
For example, there is something called the memory palace. Nobody taught us how to remember. You just had to figure it out and remember. You study for five years or four years and go and write exams. So these are the two main areas that they teach. But there are other four important areas. Uh, the first one is perception, you know, how we perceive things, how we see things, everybody sees things differently. So most of our disagreement in life and even divorce in marriage, it all boils down to perception. Also, the will is our ability to hold, you know, in consciousness or in imagination what we want in life to the exclusion of all others. And then we have imagination. Albert Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge. Why? because knowledge is limited to that which we are aware of. Imagination is everything. Imagination is everything. It's more important than knowledge, and it's true. I think the former British Prime Minister of Israel, he said, imagination governs the universe. Everything that you and I see around us, everything, everywhere, begins with imagination. So imagination is so important, and we will talk about it as we go along. And the last is, you know, uh, intuition. Intuition is actually faculty of the heart, uh, but we use the mind to interpret intuition. People call it gut feeling. You know, um, now we know that actually the heart has a memory on its own. We have over 40,000, you know, neural dendrites, you know, a dendrous neuro in the heart. It's amazing. So most of the time, the heart is able to perceive and then the brain interprets and they are researched to back it up. It's amazing. But they don't teach all these for, you know, it's like the right brain. So it's been found out that those who have made things happen in life, actually those who have learned to develop all the higher faculties of the mind to the extent that they are able to achieve whatever they want in life without violating the rights of others. So if you reach his book, Rich, um, uh, think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill. You know, probably a lot of you guys have read the book Think and Grow Rich. He spent a lot of years, you know, almost 20 years interview the most successful men in the U.S. at that time. You know, Henry Ford, you know, Carnegie, Edison, trying to find out what they make, you know, what made them successful. And later on, he wrote the book Think and Grow Rich. And there is a chapter that he talk about, you know, special knowledge. And he said, and it's true, that those who have succeeded are those who have developed all these higher faculties of the mind, their imagination, their world, their perception, their intuition, and they are able to make things happen. So I'm so happy when people talk about you know, self-development. So I just want to say thank you, the church again, for putting this together. And I also want to say thank you for that wonderful introduction. You know, and Eric, your introduction, I just want to say thank you. But I want to say that my life didn't start that way. Those of you who don't know me. Um, so I grew up in Kumasi, the same area that Eric grew up square. And growing up, my father did not have a formal education. My mother, both of them didn't have formal education. My father had two wives, my mother and my you know, younger, you know, my stepmother. Uh, if I should put it that way, his second wife. And my mother had nine children. And my father also had six children from another marriage before that. In addition to that, my father had a lot of nephews and nieces. My other mother also had the same. And my mother, so our, our home was like, <laughs> you know, it's like a, a dormitory, a school. So many of us. Now, among all the children, I was the most troublesome one. I was the one who always got in trouble. Going to school, I wasn't good. I would collect the money and I'll go and ride a bicycle we used to call Kobo Kobo, you know, or go to the cinema. This went on and it was so bad. My twin sister, Diana, she was opposite of me. She was well organized. She did her homework. In fact, most of the time I had to copy her homework and even copying was difficult for me. I remember on many occasions, even taking a shower, I will not take my shower. Or if I do something bad, I wait until everybody is asleep, then I'll come home. But guess what? Early in the morning, my father wake, up, wake me up with what came. Lashes in bed. 
Sometimes I will not take my bath and I will come and sleep. But while sleeping at night, guess what happened? They pour water on me. Now, some of you may be wondering, wow, what about the mattress? <laughs> there was no mattress. I was sleeping on the floor. So I believe some of you are aware of this. Now, I remember on, in one occasion, on one occasion, the school that I attended, I fought with somebody. And after the fight, I broke the person's chair. I just broke it in pieces. The teacher wanted to punish me and I ran away. But the problem was my twin sister, anything that I did, she will come and report me at home and I'll be in trouble. So the following day, my older brother, Big Joe, he took me to the school. And in the morning, in front of everybody, he gave me lashes. He spanked me in front of the whole school assembly. And after that, he also gave me a piece of dishing to cut, you know, which is... Anyway, so we were moving from elementary school to high school. And the area that we used to live, almost everybody was going to you know, private school. So my sister Diana, my twin sister, she also wanted to go to Diana in private school. So they took her to Diana uh, private school. And I said, no, I'm not going there. I want to stay here and do my own thing. Now there's nobody to report to me. So I was excited. So they took her to private school and I stayed in the public school. Now this went on. Now for the meantime, I wanted to become a doctor. I had this dream of becoming a doctor. But the challenge was I wasn't good. But in Ghana, as you probably know, high school wasn't for everybody. So from middle school to high school, you had to write examination. We used to call it O-level, a common entrance examination to go to the O-level. So I wrote the examination and the results came and I feel, wow, I wanna to go to high school to become a doctor. How can I go to become a doctor without going to high school? The last time I checked, anyone who tried to do that was called a quack and they arrested him. So I said, okay, I'm going to write it again. So the following year, I wrote it again and I barely passed the examination. My results, I got 196. It was so poor that none of the three schools that I chose wanted anything to do with me. I went there, they said, go away, go away. So that was tough. Now, what am I going to do? I still want to become a doctor. Wow. Now, for the, my, my mother, you know, had a dream. I was like 12 years, 13 years. And he said, I saw you. And you become an older person. And you were wearing white. But to me, in Ghana, the only, you know, those who were white were those, you know, as spiritual pastors, we used to call them, you know, or doctors, all right? And I wanted to become a doctor anyway. So I, my brother, my, my brother, older brother, Big Joe, the one who came to give me lashes, you know, or spank me in this school, took me to a rural school in Ghana. In that school, electricity was unreliable, water was unreliable. You get up in the morning and you had to go and fetch water, you know? So I reached that school and I said, wow. Anyway, I learned a lot from that school and given the chance, I'll go back, but it was tough, all right? They didn't have A level. Now I managed to transfer after the first two years to a bigger school, that is where I met Eric. But before I went to this school, the first school, my brother Big Joe bought three story books for me. And in each one of them, he wrote Dr. Daniel Amua. Now, remember that I did not pass the common entrance exam for the first time. I did not pass it well the second time. This school that I attended, I didn't know anybody who went there and became a doctor. And yet my brother wrote, you know, Dr. Daniel Amua. You see, Napoleon once said, leaders are dealers in hope, all right? Even when you don't have hope. And my brother was educated. So he knew what it took to become a doctor. There were only two medical schools in Ghana. And yet he wrote that. So he made a big difference in my life, all right? Now, fast forward, I was able to transfer to a bigger school. Now, around that time, I said, I need to change. If I really want to become a doctor, and I need to be serious. And yes, when I change, 
everything changed. I became so serious with my schoolwork. I was obsessed, if I have to put it that way. It didn't matter whether it was you know, a vacation or not. It didn't matter. I was studying. I was studying in the morning, at night, all the time. Now, something began to happen. The more I studied, the more I got better. To the extent that people in my class were coming to me for me to help them. I was the guy to come to. Now, remember, most of these guys didn't know that I didn't even pass the entrance examination in the first place. Now, fast forward, we wrote the A-levels. I had, at that time, the highest you could get with one distinction, graduating top of the class. Fast forward, A-level, graduating top of the class. I'm saying this not to grab, but to, not to impress, but to impress upon you that, truly speaking, when we change, everything changes. However, all this why I knew that I was going to be a doctor. I saw myself, literally, I saw myself and there was nobody who was going to dissuade me. I believe this strongly, every fiber of my being without doubt that I was going to be a doctor. And later on, as we find out, when you change this self image, the way you see yourself, truly speaking, things begin to change. So today, since then, I've been, you know, I said to myself, if I can change, everybody has to be able to change. And I've therefore dedicated myself to studying so that I can help. There is a saying that Jomas always say that you can't give what you don't have, all right? And I believe strongly that this self-education actually is most of the time what is missing a lot of people's life. They may be good academically, but if you don't have a father, mother who will be able to help with you about, you know, help you about communication, about marketing, about, you know, leadership, public speaking, whatever it is, you know, then you can find yourself wanting. So again, I just want to say thank you, PR and VC leadership for putting this together. Today, I would like to share with you the art of becoming who you want to be and achieving what you want in life. And as you know, one of my favorite quotes, as they mentioned in the introduction, is by Kayon, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you call it fate. Until you make the unconscious, it will direct your life and you call it fate. You got to make the unconscious conscious. Why? Because it's the unconscious. It's like programming. That is directing our life, all right? So I have an acronym here called GIFTED that I'm gonna share with you. The G is stand for goals. I is for identity shift. F for focus. T, taking action. E, expectation, living in that expectation. And the D is detaching yourself from the outcome. So let's start. I think we have a lot to cover today, but I'm excited. So I think as we go, please, if you have any question, I will say that maybe after I finish, yes, we will give you the chance to ask questions. But if you want any clarification as we go, you can also ask and hopefully we'll be able to clarify it for you. So let's talk about goals, all right? So it is important, everybody knows in self-development that you have to have goals, all right? Because research has shown that when you have a goal, your chances of achieving it is higher than if you don't have any goal, then you don't know where you are going. So goal is important. But the question is, what kind of goal are you going to set? How big is it going to be your goal? Why is it that some people set this small goal? and others set bigger dreams and goals. It all boils down to belief. So before you even write down your goals, you have to change certain beliefs. I'm talking about the subconscious beliefs that we all have. These disempowering beliefs, because it's not about the body. I think the Bible said that all things are possible for those who believe. We can also say that all things are impossible for those who don't believe. 
It all boils down to beliefs. Because three, four, ten people can see something and we will perceive it differently. And it's all boils down to belief. Now, there are many disempowering beliefs, but I want to share with you three that are most common. It affects almost everybody. Almost everybody. Yes, it could be some people, it could be very high. You know, some people, it could be very small. But almost all of us, all of us have had this belief. The first one is, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. The second one is mistakes and failures are bad in life. And the third one is I'm not important. Now, let's, let's, let's take our time and analyze this, all right? First one is I'm not good enough. Most of these beliefs are formed in childhood. When we are young, four years, five years, six years. Let's give an example. There's a five-year-old child, we're five-year-old, and you do something, and your parents reprimand you, punish you, whatever it is. You do it again, and they do it same. With time, at a five-year-old, the only logical conclusion is I'm not good enough. And that is not bad. It's a not bad conclusion, but a five-year-old child, usually they have one viewpoint. I'm not good enough. Because if I'm not good enough, why is it that I'm always getting into trouble? All right? It happens. Now, the other one is mistakes and failures are bad in life. You make a mistake, they punish you. Of course, mistakes and failures are not good. That is why I'm being punished. You go to school, you, you get 90%, you come home, guess what? Your parents look at it and they look at it 10% that you didn't get, right? All right? Now, those of you who are older enough in Ghana, they used to call something mental. Early morning, you go to school, they give you five or 10 questions, all right? Each one that you get wrong, they spank you. Could imagine. Of course, mistakes and failures are bad. Now, this can affect you as you get older. And the other one is, I'm not, imp I'm not important. Your rehearsal, your play, whatever it is, your parents couldn't come. A five-year-old, six-year-old will say, I am not important. That is why they didn't come. Now, we have to confront it. The question is, how do you do that? So first, you go back. Let's take, for instance, I'm not going to know. When did you, somebody say, okay, 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 I don't have that. But the question is, do you have a dream, something you want to achieve? that you haven't started or that you failed to start, most of the time, that is what you are saying. I'm not good enough. Subconsciously, that is what you are saying. Or if you have a business or something that you want to start, but you don't want to lose your money, you, want, you are saying that failure is bad, all right? Mistakes and failure, you don't want to make the mistake. It happens all the time in sports everywhere. That is what it means. Or you are in school and you are not volunteering, you know, you are not, you know, sharing your ideas, you are not contributing. Maybe you are saying, I'm not important. So coming back to mistakes and failures are bad. Go back and think about when was the first time you realized that I'm not good enough, for example. Maybe something happened five years, six years old, and you realize that you are not good enough. Now, again, as a five year, six year old, that was a logical conclusion. But now, when you go back and you try to remember, you sit down quietly and you realize that incident and you ask yourself, yes, this is what happened. And this is the interpretation, the meaning that I gave. But could there have been another reason? And the answer is yes. Maybe you were not good enough at something, but it didn't mean that you were not good at other things. You get what I mean? You, you, you were not good at this, but you were good in other areas. 
You were not good academically, you were not good at sports, you were not good, but you were good at other areas. But a five-year-old usually is unable to see all these other reasons. So when you go back and you think about it, for example, mistake and failures are bad. You know, parents, you know, parents probably had their own problems. They were loving, they were kind, but they never attended any, you know, parenting school. It didn't mean that you were not loving. It didn't mean you were not important. Maybe they had their own problems. So it is the meaning we give to what happened. But the moment you begin to challenge this, then you realize, wait a minute. This was all in my head. It wasn't true. By the way, there is a place that you can go. It's called recreateyourlife.com. Okay? Um, Montelefco method. It's a free interactive process that you can use to challenge some of these subconscious beliefs. Because the moment you begin to realize that, wow, mistake is part of life. There's nothing like mistake. We just learn and it just makes us better. It makes all the difference. The moment you realize that I'm important and I have what it takes. Anyway, so this is important. This is why it is so important. Otherwise, you always go on to set very short, very limited you know, dreams. So it's important. Now, also, as you set your goals, it is important that you write down as many why you want this dream. It's so important, all right? You have to write down why do you want. It begins with the why. Don't begin with how am I going to get it. Don't, don't start with that. The moment you start with how, it comes with all you know, uh, uh, obstacles. So it begins with why do I want this dream and write it down. I always tell people, for example, those who want to lose weight, I say, write down 20 reasons why you want to lose weight and make it emotional. You know, some people, they will not do this for themselves, but they will do it for their children. So I say, write it down. Also, tell them, write down as many reasons possible, negative, you know, consequence, if you don't achieve this dream. Write it down. Why? Because human beings throughout history, we found out that we always act to seek pleasure or to avoid pain. And we need to average that. We need to leverage that, I mean. Everything we do is to seek pleasure or to avoid pain. Even religion, heaven or hell. Now some people, they are motivated by the pleasure. But trust me, some people also have seen that you tell everything, they don't want to stop smoking. The moment they get heart attack, they stop smoking, all right? So it's important that we leverage these two, all right? So as you write it down, and this is what you can do. You have to write down and read this every single day. You can read it in the morning. You can read it into the evening. Read Because remember, when you set the goal, it is in the conscious, but you have to put it in the deeper subconscious mind. And how do you impress the subconscious mind? And by the way, those, you know, let me share this. We, the mind, nobody has seen the mind, right? The mind is the working brain, if you want to put it that way. For all intent and purposes, we can divide the mind into two, the conscious and the subconscious. The conscious is the analytical mind. The conscious is the objective mind. Even as I speak, you are using the conscious mind to analyze everywhere that is coming from me. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? That is the conscious mind. Now, the subconscious is about 90 to 95%. That is what controls everything. Now, the subconscious is where our deep, you know, long-term memory, our habit, everything is there. So initially, when you formulate your dreams with your conscious mind, you have to put it in the deeper subconscious mind. And you do it by repetition, 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 repetition. I used to write every day. I didn't know this, but I was just doing it. Before I started reading, I used to write all the grace that I want to get on my formica. And most of them came true. I used to write it. 
So it is so important that what you make sure that you read this twice a day and make it emotional. Why? Because with emotion, we are able to impress the subconscious mind. Those of you who are old enough, you remember where you are on 9 11? Anybody remember where he or she was on 9 11? Yes. Yes. Where were you and what were you doing? <laughs> yeah, you're in high school, in law class. Okay. Wonderful. Now, everybody who is in old enough, remember exactly where he or she was on 9 11. Meanwhile, when you ask a lot of people, what did you eat yesterday for breakfast? <laughs> they might not be able to tell you. And it was because of the emotion. Emotion is energy emotion. So when people say enough is now, I'm sick and tired, I need to change the prayer and the fast, yes, you are able to impress the subconscious mind. So as I said, write as many reasons as possible. Now, the other thing also is make it big. We mentioned that. And even as you write the reason, don't make it more about you. Make it more about serving other people. So that is the goal. Now, let's talk about the identity shift, the, G, the I. There is an old law, law of correspondence. It says that as above, so below. As within, so without. Who we are on the outside. It's just a reflection of who we are on the inside. Literally, that is what it is. Far too often when we want to change, a lot of people, we just want to pursue who we are on the outside. But you have to change who you are on the inside. The German philosopher Goethe, he said, you have to be before you can do. And I think Ziegler said, put it this way, you have to be before you can do and you have to do before you can have. Literally, that is what it's about. Change comes from within. I think the Bible said, be transformed from the renewal of the mind. When we want to seek change, so I tell people, for example, those who want to lose weight, I say, put it, the strategies aside. There are many strategies. Yes, good strategies will help you. But you have to change who you are on the inside. What does that mean? It is your, your beliefs about yourself, how you see yourself, your self-image, your identity, who you think you are. That is so important. The self-image is the blueprint that we work with. You can't change by changing your identity. Otherwise, the change becomes temporary at best. And how do you change your identity? Who is our identity? Yes, we know that God created us in his own image. There's divinity within us, but we are all differentiation of the divinity. All right? So God created us in his own image. But while it's here on this earth, we need to serve. What is this identity? How do you see yourself? Henry Ford once said that whether you think you can or you cannot, you are right. Tony Robbins said that human beings always act consistently in accordance with who they think they are. Literally, that is what it is. Now, I have had a lot of patients who have done bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery, and they gain it back. One lady, I started talking to him, her about this self-image. She said, Dr. Amwa, you are right. I lost my weight. But in my mind's eye, I was still overweight. Of course, she sabotaged herself until she gained the way back. So there are two images, the one you see in the mirror, and the self-image is who you think you still are. So Max Somos, very famous plastic surgeon, actually he started teaching plastic surgery in the United States. He wrote a book called Psycho-Cybernetics. This is his observation. There were people he did plastic surgery on that it changed their life. There were other people also, although they were so beautiful, and yet they thought they were still ugly. They changed, he changed the nose, everything. Why? Because the image that they have of themselves is different from the image we have in the mirror. 
So this is important. It's like the thermostat and the temperature. You have to change the thermostat. Otherwise, if you change the temperature, you're going to come back again. So the self-image is so important and so crucial. That helps you to shift the energy. The question is, how do you change the self-image? First, you have to know who you want to become. And then you have to visualize and imagine that you are already this person. How you want to go there, don't worry about. We talk about the goal setting. You shouldn't base it on your current circumstances, your conditions, the environment, the government, your family resources. No, you are not going there because when you start with that, it's all going to be obstacle. So you have to begin to visualize and imagine that you are already that person. So we are moving away from the doing mode. Now we are being in the mood, being mode, all right? We are not doing it. We want to become that person. You literally have to become the person who is capable of doing whatever you want to do. And you do that by imagining that you are already a person. I think the Bible said, let the weak say, I am strong. It's in somewhere in the Bible, Jesus said that whatsoever thing that you ask for, believed that you receive it. He didn't say, you know, try to, no, no, it's not about future. You have to see it as a current reality and you have to feel it. Now, the best thing to, best, best time to do this is in the morning and before you go to sleep at bed at night. You go to bed at night. And let me explain why. When you look at the brain waves, as we are talking, our brain waves is in the beta state. When we go to sleep, it goes to the delta state. But it has to pass through the alpha and the theta before it goes to the delta before you sleep. Now it's been shown that when it is in the alpha state, that is about to, you're about to sleep in the theta state, you are able to actually get into the subconscious mind. And that is why children, for example, from ages you know, zero to seven, most of the time, the analytical mind is not well developed. They are always in the alpha or theta state. That is why children is so important, those of you who have children. Don't turn on the television and think that they don't know what is going on. That is the best time to make a big difference because the analytical mind is the watchman at the gate. When people are older and they begin to make the affirmation, I am strong, I'm healthy, the analytical mind says, oh, no, 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 Kwabna, you are not strong, you are not healthy. Remember the last time you are always sick. Remember what grandmother said? Remember? Yes. But it's been shown that when you are about to sleep, your analytical mind actually goes more or less to sleep. We call the analytical mind the watchman at the gate, all right? It is the one that analyzes and rejects. But then you are able to impress the subconscious mind because when your brain wave is in the alpha state, from seven to 14 you know, cycles per second or hertz. So in the morning, when you wake up or when you are going to sleep, you pray, do your prayers, and then you imagine the kind of person you want to be. And not don't only imagine it, you have to feel it as if it's already true. How is going to get there? Maybe for God. So it's so important. So that is the identity shift. So someone put it, say, assume the feelings that will be yours if you had already received what you want. So you live from the end because they say acceptance of the end was the means to the end. So it is so important. Again, you will look at the strategies, you will talk to people and how to get there. But the most important thing is who am I? You want to wait until you achieve whatever you want before you see that you already that person. No, you don't want to do that. So even whilst you are sleeping on the floor, you have to imagine and feel that you are already that person. You are rich, you are successful. That is how you do that. You see, some people want to see it before they believe it. 
Brothers and believers, we have to believe before we see it. We have to ignore the evidence of the five senses. I can't say this enough. We have to ignore the evidence of the senses and assume the feeling that will be yours. That is what Jesus said. I think Mark chapter 11, 23 or so. Whatsoever things that you ask for, believe that you've already received it. How would I feel if I have already received this? Wow. Imagine people congratulating you. Imagine receiving the certificate. Imagine how would that feel and be grateful as if it is already happened. And then see yourself and begin to walk that walk that you are already person. So that is the identity shift. So that is the self image is so important. Now, the next one is the action T. So we talk about gene goals, I, identity shift, T, um, F is the focus, yes. T is taking action, uh, E is expectation, and D is detachment. So focus. Now, let's talk about focus or the world. It's one of the higher faculties of the mind. You see, your ability to hold in consciousness or imagination or on the screen of your mind that which you want in life to the exclusion of all other things is what makes all the difference. You can be the most brilliant person you can be, but if you cannot focus, no. Remember, the focus is, the, is more or less the power you have to make things happen. Those who study quantum physics, they will tell you that in quantum physics, everything is like possibility, all right? There are so many possibilities. You can become this, you could become this, but it is your focus. So there is a very famous experiment. It's called the double split experiment. They look at photons that is passing through, you know, slit. Now, when you are not looking or when we are not measuring, that photon behaves like what? Waves. It moves through various this and then form interference behind. More or less, it, you know, it, it passes through various slits, all right? It behaves like waves, let's put it that way. But the moment you begin to look at a photon, it changes to particle. It forms a line. It doesn't form interference. In other words, the photon is the things you and I are made of, as if the photon knew exactly what is going on. So that we believe that there are many, many possibilities. But when you are not focused on what you want, then you're going to be a problem. In fact, when you think about it, they say that where you place your focus is where you place your energy. Where your attention goes is where your, you know, your, your energy goes. It is so important that we are able to focus on that which we want to see happen. All our happiness, unhappiness, our stress, it's all because of what? Our focus. So for example, if you focus on what you don't want in life, then you're going to be stressed out, all right? If you focus on, if this is what I've seen. Those who focus on what they don't want, what is lacking in their life, the problems in their life, they get unhappy. Once you focus on what you can do, what you love to do, what is going on in your life, what you are grateful, you are good. So the focus is so important. And we also have to remember that the brain cannot tell the difference between imagination and reality, all right? Also, the brain doesn't know that I don't want this, okay? All the brain is concerned about is the picture you are giving to the brain. So I know that some of us want to pray and we want to attack all the devils, all the demons every day. When you do that all the time, you, that picture, you are focusing on what you don't want. Okay, you don't want that. The question is, what do you want? So it's the picture. The brain cannot tell, I don't want. No, the brain can tell that. So if you focus on what you don't want, instead of focus on what you want, it will bring fear, anxiety. That is what it's about. So please, it is so important that we focus 
on what we want and not what we don't want. Now, let, there are a few exercises you can do to increase your ability to focus. And those of you who have children, maybe they may be suffering from ADHD, you know, or ADD. There are a few exercises that have been tested that have been shown to be helpful. So even if you don't have a child with ADHD, you can also do it to help you help focus more, or you can share with somebody with that problem. The first one, is you can get a sheet of paper and you make a small dot and you put it on the wall and you sit maybe 10 feet, six feet away from it. And then you try to focus on that for two minutes, five minutes. If you blink, that is okay. It's being shown to help you focus. That is one. The other thing also you do is you can get a picture all right, of any picture. And then you sit down and take a look at the picture vividly. And after that, you close your eyes and you begin to what? Imagine and see the picture in your mind's eye that has also been shown to be helpful. And the other one is before you go to bed, you begin to see everything that happened in the day in reverse order, all right? Just before you went to bed, what were you doing? You imagine that. Maybe you brush your teeth, all right? Before that, what were you doing? You were talking to the children. Before that, what were you doing? You were having, you know, dinner. Before that, you came home. So try to put it in reverse order. I do this with my children. It's being shown to increase your ability to focus. It is so important because if you can focus, you can make things happen. So that is that. Now, the next one is taking action. That is where the rubber meets the road, right? Yeah, it is so important. And um, I think, you know, um, Joseph Campbell said that the fear, I said the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. All right, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. You have to take action. But be warned, let me tell you quickly. Before you take action, there are a few things we need to remember. We are here. And whatever we want, the dreams we want are here. Endless possibility, good health, good relationship, abundance. You know, everything, peace of mind, happiness, it is here. Now, between where we are and where we want to go, there is a barrier. And that barrier is fear. That barrier is pain. And everybody has to go through that. You can't get away from that. We have to bear this in mind. The moment you begin to move from where you are to where you want to go, you meet this barrier. The body actually begins to produce chemicals that make you uncomfortable. Remember, that is normal. That is normal. In fact, someone said life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Now, a lot of people, the moment they begin to embark on anything new and they meet this barrier, guess what they do? They come back to their comfort zone and therefore they live a very limited life. I don't know about you, but there are certain things in my life I wanted to do, I didn't do it. And looking back, it was that barrier. Now, there is a very famous book called The Tools, written by Barry Michaels and Fusta. They are very two famous psychologists in LA, and they have had the privilege and the chance to talk to literally thousands of people. And I'm talking about ordinary, you know, men and women, movie stars, you know, movie directors. This is what they find. Everybody goes through this barrier. The difference between successful and unsuccessful people is how they do about it and how they interpret this barrier. A lot of unsuccessful people think it means no, 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 no. 
successful people, either consciously or unconsciously, they are able to go through this. So I tell people, remember that the moment you meet this barrier, that means something good is beginning to happen. It, it is beautiful because comfort will ruin your life. You have to become comfortably uncomfortable. Now, this is easier said than that. But yes, you're going to feel it. There's a, one thing also that we have to bear in mind. There's no much difference between fear and excitement. We feel this in the body. So physiologically, fear and excitement feel the same. Palpitation, sweating in the arm, you know, butterfly stomach, it, it is normal. In fact, even if you don't feel that way, it means what you are going to do probably is not important. It is so, so normal for everybody to feel that way. But how do you then change the fear to excitement? The difference is how you use your body. And what you are saying to your mind, what you are saying to yourself and what you focus on. So for example, if you sit down or you, you know, you, you, your chest out, your shoulder up and you begin to take a deep breath, guess what? And you begin to focus on what you want, not what other people are thinking, what mistakes you're gonna make. No, you think about what you want, the difference you wanna make, focus on that and then use your body physiologically in the best way that you can. When you do that, it turns the fear to excitement. Please, this is so important. You see, when we watch soccer, those of you who watch soccer or basketball, when they get a free throw or penalty, somebody like Cristiano Ronaldo will sit down and they do the stand there and take a deep breath. And guess what? before they execute that. I mean, this guy has won the Ballon d'Or like four or five times, all right? And he's very confident, but he didn't know how to change the fear into excitement. So remember, teach the children. There is no much difference between fear and excitement. It is normal for you to have a palpitation, for you to have a swelling of the palm, for you to go through that. It is absolutely normal. Now the book is called The Tools. Now, they give a few things that you can do, but please, that is what we have to bear in mind, that it is normal for you to go through that. Also, we have to bear in mind that our fear is coming from our imagination. As I said earlier, imagination is one of the higher faculties of the mind, but nobody teach us how to what, use our imagination. I always say that probably I missed that class when they were teaching us. Nobody taught us, but imagination is so important. In fact, Albert Einstein has so many quotes on that. Because they say imagination is the preview of your life coming attraction. All our fears and anxiety is because of imagination. Come to think about it, it hasn't happened yet. You are afraid that the snake is going to bite you. So you miss me see they say, oh, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, ha, now you begin to put on the tongues. Truly speaking, it's imagination, all right? All our fears. Now, this is the deal. Again, the subconscious mind, that which determines how we feel, is unable to tell the difference between imagination and reality. Now, we use this against ourselves. We have to rather use it for ourselves. So instead of imagining worse things happening, begin to imagine that something good is going to happen. And when that happens, Actually, it calms you down. So imagination is so important. We have to bear in mind. Also, if you ask you take action, make sure that you do the hard and the difficult things. You know, most of the, those are the things we want to post, you know, uh, uh, you know, just um, put it away. You know, we have to make sure that we tackle those. And uh, Brian Tracy wrote a book called Eat That Frog. And in that book, he lists the way you have to tackle the most important things first. You know, those of you that are, you know, familiar with um, at the 80-20 principle, you know, or Pareto's principle, 
It says that whatever we have to do in life, if we categorize them in order of importance and we focus on the top 20%, we get 80% return. In my the same way, if we focus on the less 80 and less important, the 80%, we get 20% return. So let's categorize everything we want to do and let's focus on the most important, sometimes the most difficult in one's face. So that is taking action. So again, the fear is in the anticipation, even as we do this. So Emerson once said, do the things you fear, or fear is setting. Our fear is in the anticipation. They have actually did some research, I think Stanford, where they put people in functional MRI. All right, it's MRI, but they give you a dye, and therefore, when you are talking, the part of the brain you are using to talking will light up. All right, when you are laughing, that part of the brain responsible for lighting, laughing will light up. Now, this is what they find when you put people in functional MRI machine, and those who are afraid of doing mathematics, all right, math phobia, some people are afraid of numbers. When they contemplate doing mathematics, the pain in the fear center lies up. The moment they begin to actually do the test or exams or mathematics, it switches off. So this actually supports what the philosophers have said thousands of years, that the fear is always in the anticipation. The moment you begin to do whatever, do what you're afraid of, actually the fear begins to go away. Now, also talking about imagination, they did a research in Harvard that those, they got volunteers and they divided them into three. And one group, these volunteers, they never played play the piano. One group went and they practiced how to play simple chord, you know, every day with, you know, one hand. The other group sit in their dormitories and then imagine as if they were playing the same chord the third group didn't do anything, all right? Now, they also scan the region of the brain every day, the region of the brain responsible for hand movement. This is what they find out. Those who went to practice every day, as expected, after a few days, they got better. Now, those who just imagine as if they were practicing, yet they didn't touch any keyboard, they also get better. The third group, nothing happened. Not only that, they also scan the region of the brain, as I said. As you know, there is something called neuroplasticity. So every skill you learn, if we scan the brain before and after, we will see a change in the structure of the brain. So if you don't know how to ride a bicycle, you learn to ride a bicycle within a week or two, we will see a structural change in the brain, that is neuroplasticity. Guess what they find? Those who went to practice every day, they saw a change in the brain. Those who just imagined vividly as if they were playing the piano, yet they didn't touch it. Guess what? They also had a change in the brain that is almost similar to those who practice. The third group, nothing happened. Now, this again goes to support the fact that our imagination, especially the subconscious mind, can't tell the difference. So let's use it. The moment we begin to entertain the fear, remember that this hasn't happened. It can happen, but it hasn't happened. And it therefore got imagination. So you have to bear in mind. Also, you have to bear in mind that you don't have to, you, you don't have to believe everything that you think about what you want to do. There's a book that I just finished reading. It's called Don't Believe Everything You Think. Far too often, that is the problem. A lot of people think that they are, they are taught. No, we are not our taught. We are spirit in this body. Our thought is a tool that we use. We are just pure spirit, pure consciousness, pure awareness, pure source, if you want to put it that way. We are the one that are aware of our thoughts. So, for example, if you are thinking, the question is, who is thinking? And who is aware that you are thinking? So, 
For how often people think that they, they are taught. So wherever they are taught, follow, go, and then they follow. No, you don't want to do that. Because they're taught, most of them are negative. Why? Because they are there to protect us. But the moment we separate ourselves from our thought, then these thoughts are not having an effect on us. And people say, how do you do that? So you do that by being mindful of what is going on. So I tell my clients, my patients, that let a thought flow like water. Don't jump in. Don't jump in. This is what you find. You will find out that, wait a minute, the same thoughts that were giving me problem yesterday, I'm having the same thought today and I just don't care. I'm just indifferent. At that time, you are beginning to just observe your thought without judgment. You can't control every thought that comes into your mind because most of them are just there to protect us. So what about this? Thought about you. Thought about other people. Some people, it just disturbs them and they can't sleep. You guys know what I'm talking about. You don't have to do that because you are not your thought. You are higher than your thought. So it's important. So even as you take action, please, you have to take action, but be comfortably uncomfortable as you even take action. The next one is expectation. Yes, you have to live in that expectation. You have to believe that you're going to become the person you want to become. You, you have to believe that. You have to live in that expectation. I can't say that enough. You have to believe that when you know the evidence is not there, when you don't have the resources, when you don't know the person, you got to believe that it's going to line up. It's only when you look back. You can't look forward and see things lining up. So if it is a business that you want to start, remember that the bankers will show up. The investment will show up. Wherever you want to start, it will show up. You don't want to start with that. That is why you have to start with an overwhelming why you want that and focus on that. And truly speaking, it will line up. When you look at anything you have achieved in your life, that is how it happened. You don't even have all these connections. But the moment you begin to what? Take that, you know, leap of faith and begin to have that leap of faith and begin to take those steps, that is where things begin to happen. You can't wait until all this happens before you take the step. So it is important that we have to live in expectation. I like soccer. And when Manchester United brought Cristiano Ronaldo back again, in his first match, he scored two goals. And after the match, they interviewed him. He said, I was expecting to score one goal, and I scored two. You see, expectation. We have to expect. We have to live in that expectation. There's something called segment intended. You pick up the phone to call somebody, you have to expect that it's going to end up well. You're going to talk to somebody, you have to expect and believe that it's going to end up well. Everything you have to do, you are going to talk to a client, you have to believe and expect that it's going to be fruitful. That is where you live. You have the bigger expectation, but in segment intent, all the segments, you have to expect that it's going to go well. It doesn't mean that everything will end up, but even if it doesn't end up well, in Latin, we call it amofari. It means the love of everything. I think the Bible said that we should give all time, all things, we have to give thanks to God, even those that you will learn something from that. So that is important. And the next one is detachment. Detachment basically is you want this, but you want to detach your emotions and yourself from the outcome. In other words, even if I don't get this, that is not the end of life. That comes to the question of who am I? Because you are not your accomplishment. And also, if you have a higher purpose, why am I going to do this business? I'm going to do this business to help other people, all right? To serve humanity. 
Then the Bible says, on all things, everything we do, we have to do it as if we are doing, you know, you know, to serve the Lord. If you have this in mind, then it doesn't matter. Even if you touch one person, that is a success. If you touch 100 people, that is good. Whatever it is, there is no failure in this. So it's not about you. It's not about, I'm going to get this and I'm going to show it to people and I'm going to buy this car. Those things, there's nothing wrong. But you don't want to become so materialistic and believe that if I get this, then I'll be happy. If I buy this car, I'll be happy. If I build this home, I'll be happy. That is a trap. The fulfillment is in the journey. It's not in the destination. You have to enjoy the journey. It's not about what, to, it's about the difference you want to make in this world. The people we want to touch. When we have this as the main focus, the purpose, then truly it does not matter. You don't even care about your mistakes you make because it is about making a difference in other people's life. It's not about me. So wherever we are, whatever we are doing, it is so important that we focus on that. It's all about making it people different. It's not about accomplishment. The last thing I forgot to mention, even as you have goals, you have to know the difference between end goals and means goals. Okay, for example, if your goal is to travel all over the world, that is a means, you know, end goals, all right? That is what you want. Now, but then you want to go and work and get a lot of money so that you can travel all over the world. That is means goals. And most of the time, you don't need the means goals. If truly your goal is to go all over the world, then you can ask yourself, can I find a job or can I do something that I can generate money whilst I'm still traveling? And the answer is yes. So you don't have to wait until you retire before you start traveling. That is means goals. Also, there is this, and I see that in the Ghanaian community, a lot of people travel to the United States or travel to Europe and they say, I'm gonna make a lot of money and I'm use that money for business. So. The business is your end goal. Making money here is means goals. But when you ask yourself and you really focus on this, you realize that the means goals is not important. You don't have to work for 10 years, 20 years. No, you don't need the money. All you have is what the ideas you need is the ideas. You have to have a compelling idea. You have to learn how to raise money. You have to learn how to market. You see, people think that I need money. To... No, no, no. All we need is ideas. When you look at the United States, all the big companies, they start with ideas. They didn't start with money. Because once you have a compelling idea, you will get people to come and invest in that. But do you know how many people spend hours working for money? And zero hours on ideas? Imagine that you spend two, three hours a day on just business ideas, ideas, and allow and listening to. It will change your life. They say that if you get up in every day and you read 30 minutes a day to an hour, within a week, you read almost one week book. We are talking about 52 books in a year. It's like PhD in personal development. I think Lincoln, Brandon Lincoln said, you cannot travel within and stay still without. It will change your life. You begin to see opportunities. You begin to see that, wait a minute, I can start real estate business without money. So why do we have to work two, three jobs to pay money? For, to, it, it is, it is mind-blowing. It is means goals versus end goals. And most of the time, we have to realize that we don't have to go through all this. 
If now, don't get me wrong. There are certain professions you want to become a lawyer. You have to be, you know, you, you want to become a nurse. What you, architect? You have to go through that training in order to become who you want to become. But some of the times, you don't need to spend all these hours working. Rather, start something. Rather, spend time looking for ideas, find mentorship, talking to people who have already done it. And you will be surprised that you don't need all these monies that you're trying to spend all your life acquiring in order to start this business. So I think that is, you know, that, you know, um, if you have questions, um, um, you can, you know, ask questions and let's see what we can do to answer some of these questions. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. At this time, uh, it's time for questions. So please, if you have questions, let's ask uh, directly. Or if you want to type it, um, we will read it for him to respond. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. By the way, is my audio clear? Yes. Yeah, so... um. This is just a general question about um, culture in general. Um, I've noticed that Ghanaians in general, we are, we are naturally fearful and we don't like taking risks. Is it because of how we are raised or is it because what we are learning over life, it's not enforcing that, that concept? So I want your thoughts on that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That is a very good question, Kofi. Um, I think in all cultures, all our fears are programming. All right? It is the environment. And the people who raised up, they were loving, they were caring, but unfortunately, they never attended any of these schools. They never read any books. So it is the same thing they pass on. So imagine in Ghana, and they did these things to protect us, all right? You want to go and do some crazy stuff. There's no ambulance, right? So if you jump over the wall, they say, get down. Yes, that, that makes sense. You know, you got to be careful. Every, everything, you got to be careful. You got to be careful because they knew. But it's all boils down to programming, all right? Yes, fear is all programming. That is why what you are afraid of, another person is not afraid of. There is a village in Thailand, the woman, 70 years, 80 years, they go into the cave. There's a lot of river and they catch it, you know, with your hand. They catch with your hand, most poisonous snakes, try to get venom to sell to people who use it for all kinds of, you know, sort of things. They are not afraid. That is the programming. So it all boils down to program. That is why initially I said we had to confront some of these program, childhood programs, I'm not good enough, all right? Talking about failures, you know, and mistakes. How many times did I get canes? As I said, I wasn't good at school. So the mentor, I was always in trouble. Sooner or later, you get conditioned to believe that mistakes are not good. You want to avoid it. We want to avoid it. And it's all programmed. And it's time we challenge this. So you can go to recreateyourlife.com. This is free interactive process. And you can do that. But thank you. It's a very good question. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, please, can you hear me well? I'm driving. But uh, this is Tony, Senior Danny. This is Tony, uh, high school. Oh, Tony, uh, good to yeah. hear from you. Eric, I uh, invited me to join this uh, conversation. Yeah, right up. I was going to talk about, you just mentioned about the mental example that you've been given. That, uh, to me, uh, it seems you have given some negative connotation to that. But my personal experience when I was in the middle school, just like you were mentioning, We've been beaten every day by the mentor. Uh, the teacher will come every morning, history, geography, and he will be beating us every day. Based on the beating that he was beating me every day, I asked a friend of mine who was never being beaten, why was it that he wasn't beaten? And he showed me that this is how you do it. You have to memorize it. You have to learn this way. So to me, the mentor 
was the positive aspect in my life because I had not been a mentor. I don't think I was going to find any means or any ways or any uh, anything forcing me to learn so that I wouldn't be teaching. So I want to know if what you are trying to say is that the mentor that we were going through in the school, at least our part of our schooling, was a negative aspect as that has been affecting our lives in the future or what? Thank you, Tony. That is a good question. So it's like punishing your children, all right, or reprimanding them. So when my children do something and I reprimand them, I always try to convey, you know, the message that the reason why, especially I'm, I'm doing that, because children can form all kinds of sort of meaning, all right? Now, there are so many ways that you can get the best out of children, all right? Um, there is a book called The One Minute Manager. Um, they are the same people who wrote the book, you know, called The Chicken, uh, not The Chicken, what is the name? Um, um, who Moved My Cheese, all right? And they found out that your expectation of people actually affect how they perform, all right? And I believe that there are so many ways that you can use to get the same results without having to punish the person, especially physically. There are some people, they don't care about that. I, I, was, I was spanked many times, even in front of people. But my brother, Big Joe, the one I mentioned, I love him because had it not been him, I, will, I, will, I was a crazy kid, all right? Yeah, so it has a purpose. However, they didn't know. And a lot of people, that can affect their self-confidence. Yes, a lot of people that can. I remember one of my sisters, she had a big mark, you know, behind her legs because of Ken, a big scar, all right? So a lot of people, that can affect them. So the teachers had good intentions, but if you are punished for every mistake that you did, yes, there are some people like you, it will cause them to actually make that change. But there are some people, they grow up, they begin to learn that, wow, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want to make a mistake. And therefore, I'm not going to try. That is what we're talking about. That's it to prevent some people because mistakes are bad. It has reinforced that and it has conditioned that, especially when, if you are young. If you are older, you may probably want to see, you might see that, oh, the teacher is trying to help me. But especially younger kids, they can have a really, really, it can have a bad impact on their life. Thank you, Tony, again. Thank you so much, Dr. Amor. You're welcome. I have this question. Uh, I think it's it's a broad question. Um, and I think it will apply to a lot of students here. It's about how to deal with failure. Um, because some of us come from backgrounds where, like we discussed, we are not used to failure. Failing and processing it in a way that we can move ahead and use them as linchpins to move to the next level. So is there a way to, um, a simple way to put it out, how a student, when you meet failure, for example, I can, I can do an experiment and you spent a lot of months trying to do the experiment and it fails, or you prepare for an examination and then you fail the examination. What processes do you suggest that someone will use to move from there to the next level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for this question. Yes, there are many ways that you can do. Um, the, the, the failure, what we have to bear in mind is, John Marshall said that failure is the price you pay for success. So the failure is okay. You cannot succeed without failing. So for anybody to think that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to fail, it is, it is not realistic. It is part of us. And we also have to learn that there is a learning in failure. You know, God orders our steps. Sometimes you don't get here, it passes you. There is a learning in failure. I, I think that is the challenge. When that something happens in our life, in the way we process it, so we have post-traumatic growth and post-traumatic stress disorder, all right? Something, you know, bad happened. It's how we process it. So the question is, what am I learning from this? 
if I fail at this, it doesn't mean I'm failure. John Maxwell wrote a book called Failing Forward. All right? He said the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is how they meet the meaning and how they interpret failure. A lot of people, when they fail at something, they think they are failures. No, you are not a failure. You fail at doing something. And the earlier you fail, the better. Actually, I think you guys know this experiment that at students, the class was divided into two. And they were supposed to make a pot, all right, with clay. One group, they were going to, they were supposed to make one pot. And they were going to be measured, you know, or, you know, yeah, they, 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 this thing was going to be measured based on how good the pot looks. The other group, they were supposed to make as many pots as possible. You know, guess what? Those who made as many pots as possible, they actually came with the best pot. Why? Because they failed, they make different ones. So the earlier we fail at doing something, that is better, actually. You don't go intentionally to fail, but it's okay. And again, the question comes, is why am I doing this? What is the purpose? What is the motive? If it is all about me, that can be very fearful. But it's not about me, all right? For example, those who don't want, don't want to speak in public. If it is about me and my performance, yes. But if I don't care, I'll make mistakes. I'll make grammar mistakes or whatever, but I don't care because it's not about me. It's about the difference that I'm making in somebody's life. So for example, I didn't use to lies, you know, standing in front of people and talk. And I signed up with coaching John Maxwell and came to realize that, wait a minute, it's normal. Everybody make mistakes. So please, those of you who don't want to make a mistake, there is a book written by John C. Maxwell. It's called Failing Forward. It's a book that you want to what? Get and maybe read about it. And the earlier we get over it, the better. Again, you have to go back childhood and try to find out when did I start, it could have been exams, whatever it is, and confront that belief. But thank you, that is a good question. All right, praise the Lord. Now then I have a question. Um, yeah. We know that um, there are so many uh, parents uh, we feel like our children, we know that certain profession can guarantee them and give them um, security of job, security of income. So we try to direct them to go into certain fields. Um, if the child doesn't have interest, but they trying to, um, they have interest in something that you think uh, probably it won't be very beneficial in terms of uh, job security and uh, income. Um, how, how do you go about those situations? And uh, especially if the child interest in something that you, you believe that uh, it may not help? Yeah, good question. Yeah. So I think that the final analysis the child has to make the final decision that is where we have to begin to teach them actually intuition, you know, or the Holy Spirit, you know, let it lead. Because far too often, parents, we think we know the best, and it's true, we may know because we pass through, but sometimes we will make a decision based on our own insecurities, our own fears, all right? So it's okay, the child will fail, they will make a mistake, all right? But they, 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 will, they, 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 will, they will get around. I think the most important as a parent is to one, just let our children believe that they are capable of doing anything that they want to do in life. You know, it, it's not so much because if they want to be a photographer, they can become really very good photographer, make you know all the money in it. So it, it depends. Whatever they do, they want to make sure that they are the best. They want to make sure that they are capable of making a difference in people's life. You want to make all the decision available for them, you know, to them. But at the end of it all, they have to decide because 
you don't want them to go and do something that they go to college and they stop doing it because they don't love it. So as the parents, we can advise, but we have to let them decide. And we have to let them also expose them. And that is where it comes down, not so much learning about the school staff, but I believe that a lot of people are not able to go for what they want in life especially they think this is too hard for me. What they are saying is that I don't have what it takes. I am not good enough. So as even parents, we have to let the children begin to understand that they are capable again of achieving anything that they want in life, you know, with God's will. Thank you, Pastor. I will ask a second question. We have a lot of students um, learning. I know... Back in the days, I remember um, your classmate used to say you memorize a lot of stuff. You could memorize the whole book. Is there a strategy in memorizing stuff or learning? I mean, we have students here, so probably. That. So for those of you that are going to school, um, there are a few things that I teach people going to college and going to school in general that is helpful uh, that I learned along the way. Um, one is first, you want to do well in the first semester, all right? Because once you do well, part of education is psychological. Once you do well, you begin to believe, you begin to shape this self-image, all right? But there are a few things that you can do. One, you have to learn speed reading. If you learn speed reading and you increase your speed by 50% without losing comprehension, you know, it will go a long way to help you, all right? There is a guy called Jim Quick. You can check him on YouTube, and he has a lot of, you know, videos about speed reading. Please invest the time to learn speed reading. Two, you also have to learn the textbook and know how to absorb the textbook like a sponge. And there are a few techniques that you can use. First, you take the textbook, you take the chapter, and you look at a chapter the volume of the chapter. And quickly, you look at the back of the chapter and you go through it quickly. Glance through the questions. Don't try to answer them, but glance through all the questions. And then you come back and then you look at the headings and subheading under each page. Again, the reason is that textbook, the most important in the textbook, it's only about 5 10%. Everything is just fillers, you know? So your job is to absorb what is important. So what you do is you go through the textbook and or the chapter and the headings and the subheading and anything that is underlined or italics, you read through quickly. And then after finishing that, you come back and you read the first sentence and the last sentence of each chapter. Why? Because most of the authors, they put the important is either in the first sentence or the last sentence of each chapter. Now, after you finish that, then you come back and read the whole chapter. Trust me, by the time you finish, the most important things you would have gone through almost four or five times, and you will understand it. Now, talking about memory, the brain remembers pictures more than words. All right. There's something called memory palace that, again, people should spend time to invest time to, to learn. So whatever you want to learn. All right. Let's say you are going to the market. You want to buy five things. All right. You want to buy um, a cheese, a bread, cheese. You want to buy, you know, fish. You want to buy whatever milk, whatever it is. It's been fine on that. In memory palace, by the way, they've used memory palace thousands of years. For example, some kings were able to use it to remember literally thousands of names. All right? The brain remembers pictures more than words. So, for example, in your home, you remember where everything is. For example, you know where your letter box is, your driveway your garage or your entrance. When you enter your home, the left, what do you see? Okay, so maybe it could be piano, whatever it is, television. So these things, 
you already have them in your mind. You always remember it wherever you are. So what you want to do is whatever you are learning, you want to ridiculously associate what you are learning with what is there. So you can label, for example, your letter bus, you label it one, driveway, you label it two, and your doorway, you label it three. We call it ridiculous association. So imagine, for example, you are going to town and you want to buy, what we say, you want to buy, let's say, bread. So you're going to imagine, for example, that you came home and you open your letterbox and there was this bread that moved, all right? And that is one. You always remember the bread, big bread in the letterbox because it's a ridiculous association. Now cheese you wanted to buy. So imagine that you came home and the driveway, your son or your daughter has cheese smell over and then what? They were playing it. That is a ridiculous association you always remember. You enter your doorway, all right? And then maybe you wanted to buy fish, but then you see a big fish in front of the doorway. You see, we call it ridiculous association. We call it memory palace. You can go online, you can learn it. There are a lot of books actually that have been written about memory. And as I said, memory is one of the higher faculties of the mind, but they expect you to remember, but they don't teach you how to remember. So if you're a student, as I said, we talk about personal development, but when you are so busy in school and you are finding it difficult, you know, with your subjects, you know, that you are learning, then you can't do other stuff. So if you take time to learn about um, uh, speed reading, and then about how to read a textbook and absorb it, and then, you know, uh, lastly, about memory, using memory palace, it will amaze you. All those who participate in memory competition in the world, that's what they use, memory palace. And they are able to remember things like that. And they don't forget it until they decided they don't want to remember it any longer. It is very helpful. So I hope the students, you know, take note of this. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Amor. Yes. Um, there's a question in the chat um, from Obed. His question is, please, how do we know the end goal is right for us? That is, whether it is smart and God-inspired. It's a good question, yeah. So the end goal, as you said, is what you really want in life, all right? What is the final, what, what is it, and why do I want it, all right? So usually when it is about you, then, it, it, you know, everybody is different, you know? That is why we have to pray about it, we have to fast about it, we have to use our intuition or let the Holy Spirit, you know, guide us, all right? But the angle is you ask yourself, when I have achieved this, how will I feel? All right? Now, there is something you can also do exercise um, that can help you. So this is what you do. You sit down and you imagine that you are 90 years old, all right? Or you are 100 years old and you are about to die. How would this 90 years old or 100 years old, you are sitting in your rocking chair about that, how would this person advise you? Almost always when you sit down and you listen to this 90 year old version of yourself or 100 year old version, guess what? You get a good answer. So the question always is going to be, yes, end goal means goal. You ask yourself, Okay, I want to become a lawyer, but you got to go through the means of becoming a lawyer by going through the school. It's, that is okay. But I want to do a business. Huh? What, you know, so, so the means goes is what you want, exactly who you want to become. And the question is, do I have to go through all these in order to become this? And most of the time you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a waste of time. I don't have to do that. All right? For example, Elon Musk started Tesla, but he didn't go to uh, uh, Detroit to learn all about automobile. No, you don't have to do that. So the angle and the means go, yes, as I said, some profession, you have to go through that. But most of the time, when you really take time, you might realize that 
the end goal is different from the means goal. But as to whether it is right for you or not, you have to pray about that. You have to, you have to ask, you know, your older, you know, self. And then you have to talk about, you know, talk, you know, talk to people who have done it before. Sometimes you may realize that that is not what you want at all. If you find actually what goes on. Yes, um, the, thank you, Dr. Amwa. There's a question here about uh, dealing with um, stratifying needs at different stages of life. So, for example, um, someone in high school may have different um, ways of stratifying what is important in their life. Someone in the university, maybe undergrad or graduate school or in med school or further along in their career may have different ways of stratifying their need, maybe whether school or family or finance. There are some people who struggle with trying to stratify needs and attending to them in terms of energy, like you talked about focus, have been able to shift focus when it is needed to what is needed at different points in time. So what do you advise for someone who may have challenge in shifting focus and then maybe in terms of first stratifying and also shifting focus as and when it is needed to what is needed at every point in their life. Yeah, so um, the, what I want us to remember that every point in our life is important, all right? No two ways about that. But we also have to bear in mind that personal development is the most important thing. Now, when you go to school, the education is being done unto you, all right? It is people's agenda. The agenda is you finish, you fit into the job market, which is okay. That is the agenda. But the question is, you want to become more so that you can give, all right? You can't give what you don't want. So in that case, there are a few things that you can do. So John Maxwell has written a lot of books, all right? And he talked about 24 irrefutable laws of leadership. And in a section, it talks about priority. So there are a few questions that you can ask yourself. One, what is required of me? What is it that I alone can do that nobody can do for me? As a parent, being there for your children. As a student, you are required to do. So we are talking about, we are talking about, you know, priorities here. All right. As a student, I'm supposed to submit this assignment. So there are certain things that you alone, you can't delegate. You, can, you alone has to do it. So that is first one. Two, what gives me the greatest returns? There are so many things competing for my time. That is where the Pareto principle comes in. Look at what is important for you. Categorize them. You cannot do everything, but then focus on the most important thing and rather focus on it and don't take your eyes off until you get it done. Raining or shining. It takes some time. Now with Instagram, Twitter, everything. So there is a lot of things going on. But please focus on what you want done and get it done. And then the next question you ask is, what gives me the greatest satisfaction? So the first one is the one that I know, what is required of me. Two, the greatest return. And three, the greatest you know, satisfaction. Now the rest, if you get to it, that is fine. If you don't get to it, that is fine. There is a book written by Brian Tracy. It calls Eat That Frog. If you want to learn how to prioritize and get this done, eat that frog. The other, tip, the other thing that you can do is use what we call Parkinson's law to also help you. So Parkinson was, um, I think, English economist. 
And he realized that, you see, Parkinson's law says that work expands to take the time allotted to it, or it contracts to take the time allotted to it. Now, example, if you are in school and the teacher give you assignment and the teacher tells the class that you have one month to submit that assignment, guess what, how long it takes for people to submit that assignment? One month, all right? A lot of the time, even that morning, people submit that assignment. Now, if the teacher asks the case, you know, to, you know, you have one week to submit it, guess how long they take? One week. So that is Parkinson's law. Work will expand to take the time given to it or contract. So this is what we find out. A lot of people, yes, if the average time is four hours and then you give them two hours, guess what? They're going to use two hours to do it. Also, if you give them eight hours, they're going to use eight hours to do it. You see, the human brain, we get distracted left and right. Now, the shorter the time, you are able to focus and get it done. So a lot of people, in fact, Elon Musk used Parkinson's law. He set the short time, time limit. So he is always not able to meet the target. But guess what? It helped the team get things done. So whatever you want to do, don't say I have all this time to do it. No, 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 no. Shorten the time, focus on that, and actually the final. That is amazing. So this guy, he wrote the book called The uh, Four, uh, Four Hour Way Week. You know, um, Tim, Tim uh, what's the name? Um, um, forgotten the name. Anyway, I think I have it up here. Anyway, so that is what they found out that if you do the Pareto's principle, the 80%, 80 20, and you add Parkinson's law, your productivity skyrockets. All right. But this is what I want to say. is frozen. I think that will be the last question. Um, after that, we are, our time is up. Let's see if he will come back. And then uh, after he finishes the, this question, I will ask if Pastor wants to say anything before we close. We lost him. Let's wait till he log back in. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving seeks my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in heaven. Space. 
His gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died Yeah, so my 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 the destin went off here, yeah, my connection. So I'm using my cell phone and it looks like I have a different background, you know. But yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. So as I was saying, they found out that in the United States, uh, those who have finished college, almost 42%, they will never pick up any non-fiction book and read it from, you know, um beginning to end in other words the education you know has been done to them all right they finish school they think it's done so please i want to say that wherever you are the more you learn the more you realize that wow life is all about learning and life is all about getting better that is the only way you can make a difference in people you know around you and people in the church and that is you have to learn and you have to make time for that but yes as we said, this priority question, there are a lot of books. When you read 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell, the section about priority talks about this very well. And also, It's This Fraud by John Tracy also talks about this you know, very well. And I hope this is, it will be helpful. Thank God bless you, uh, Mr. Adani. God bless you for being a blessing to us, uh, we know your time and everything, but when I spoke to you, you said you were going to make time for us because you've been a student before, you've been in our shoes before, you've been in the PRW before. Pastor, actually, he knows Pastor Carl very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. So at this time, I will leave it. Uh, I'll hand over to Pastor. Yeah. All right, Doc, um, thank you again for your time you know time is very precious and you've sacrificed over two hours to be with us it's a pleasure um, pr rochester and buffalo district want to say thank you and god richly bless you for what you're doing for mm -hmm. not just the church but humanity uh, we we really honor you and we hope that um another time you would um grace us and um come and uh, share with us your um, rich experience and in depth in knowledge. So thank you and God richly bless you for your time. Um, You're welcome. Really... You're welcome. Amen. Um, we will ask uh, Elder Mark to give us closing prayer. And then uh, tomorrow, God willing, we will climb us our uh, revival. So please, uh, church is 10 a.m. Let's come on time. Amen. Dr. Mark, if you keep us closing prayer, Pastor will share the benediction. Thank you. Um, shall we pray? Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this chance that you granted us to come together, to be blessed with how to grow, how to expand, how to take root, and how to be fruitful. We thank you, God, for your servants that through whom you've blessed us with a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience, a wealth of understanding. We pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you continue to bless him. Continue, Lord, to empty yourself 
into him. Pour out your soul into him, Lord, that he will be a blessing more and more to many generations in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, supply him with more virtue than all the virtue that has flowed from him tonight. Lord, let it be replaced a thousand folds by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray that bless his family, continue to keep him and his family. And Lord, at every point in time when he stands to speak, Lord, may blessings flow and grace in Jesus' name. We use this opportunity to also pray for students in our midst. Lord, let grace abound for them in Jesus' name. Let the blessings they have received in this meeting ride their lives, drive their life to be excellent men and women like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, to be the best at what they do, to be the best in what they put their effort to in Jesus' name. And we pray for workers that let grace abound for them as well. Mm -hmm. In their workplace, may they be exceptional. In their workplace, may they be dependable. May they be people, by the application of these principles, people who will have a wealth of blessing to share with any corporation that depends on them in the name of Jesus. And may that translate also into the church that we will grow, we will bring up men, women, and children who will know you, who will be excellent, who will be knowledgeable, full of wisdom and understanding, who will impact the world to come. We thank you, Father. Let your grace continue to be with us as we come. Continue with the revival. Let your grace abound. May we see your hand mightily in our lives. We give you praise for a wonderful session tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's receive the blessing. Now may him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you can think or imagine according to the power that is at work within you. May he bless you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God Amen. bless you all for coming. God, God bless you. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you. Thank you.